All right, everybody, we're going to continue with this last day of the NTO Generation Speaker Series. And I have the pleasure to present um, two friends, great people who are doing amazing work. They have brought more of the policy and advocacy work to MAPS, uh, which is really very important. Um, and this is uh, Ismail Ali and, um, and Natalie Ginsberg. So, N Natalie, yeah, give them a, a round of applause. <laughs> So, so Natalie founded the, the policy and advocacy department in MAPS and is the, the director of, of that uh, uh, department. And uh, Ismail is a, a counsel to uh, this, this program uh, and he advocates to eliminate the barriers to access to, uh, to research and to psychedelic therapy. Uh, and he's been developing uh, kind of a strategy, uh, um, you know, advocacy and legal strategy to follow uh, to advance that, that mission. Uh, and also, he coordinates the support to clinical research in, in Latin America. So give it up to them. Uh, we're going to hear uh, from them about social justice, access and outreach in the psychedelic renaissance, psychedelic medicines in the Holy Land. Woo, thank you, Ben. Can we give a round of applause to Ben, please, for being a superhero and hosting at his first burn on the second to last day, like... Really grateful for you and for the work that you do as well. So before we do anything, I'd love to invite everyone to close their eyes. And if you're able and comfortable to maybe put your feet on the ground, maybe take a moment to check in with your spine, your body, your muscles. Check in with how you're feeling today. Maybe take a moment to call in some gratitude. Call in some appreciation for whatever it is that brought you here. Whatever it is that got you to Burning Man. I invite you to maybe give yourself a little shake, a little wiggle to feel your joints. I don't know about you, but I've been dancing a lot. Really appreciate that everyone came in. It's 4 p.m. on Saturday. Whoa. Some of us have been here for a week or longer. There's dust everywhere. <laughs> the sparkly stuff everywhere. You're gonna get home and find glitter and sequins in your bag until next July because you picked it all up and brought it with you back home yeah. instead of leaving it on the playa. And maybe take a moment to think about what it is about these conversations that lights you up. Maybe you've had your own experience with psychedelic substances, maybe here, maybe at home. Maybe you know people who've benefited from their experiences with these powerful plants and molecules. These incredible beings that have participated in our expansion and enlightenment since the beginning of time. And just take a breath. So the way this is going to go today that Natalie and I are going to spend a few minutes introducing ourselves, giving you an idea of who we are and why we care and what we're doing. And we are going to flip this a bit. Some of you have probably been here for like four days straight. There's been incredible lectures going on. And we really want to turn this into a question and answer session. So we'll share a bit, but we really encourage you to start thinking about questions that you might have about this topic, social justice and psychedelics and equity and access. 
whether it's in medicine or in sacrament or something else. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the Zendo, to the Foam Home, to everyone for inviting us. We're really grateful to be here. Natalie and I don't get to speak together very often, so we're actually really excited. Usually we're in our own silos working all over the place, so it's a total pleasure and blessing to be here. Thank you. Natalie, want to give it a shot? Sure. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm really excited to be here. Sorry, guys. Is that better? OK. Um, so as Ben mentioned, I'm the director of policy and advocacy at MAPS. Um, I've been working at MAPS for five years, and most of our focus really is on making sure that politics don't get in the way of research. Um, but a lot of other work that Izzy and I focus on is looking at the community that is involved in psychedelic research um, and beyond, and making sure that people from all different, um, from all over have access to these medicines and to the tools um, of harm reduction um, and education to really understand how to, to um, clean the best benefit from them. Um, we both work at MAPS, and MAPS's focus, as many of you know, is developing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy to treat PTSD. Um, and MAPS has done a lot of research with veterans and survivors of sexual assault and many other people who've experienced trauma. Um, but something that we were noticing was that, in fact, the communities in the US in particular who experience the highest rates of trauma are the communities that are most marginalized from society. Um, and many of those communities we recognize weren't being fully um, represented in research and in the community. Um, so kind of we have been doing some work to change that. And I guess I'll pass it over to you for now. Well, maybe before that, could you share a little bit about like what you've been at MAPS for five years. What has been the arc? What's, what's the arc been like? starting there five years ago, working on cannabis policy primarily to where we are today. I think it'd be great to share a little bit of that like overarching vision for what it's been like so far. Sure, so that's a great question. I'm glad you brought up cannabis because actually what surprises many people is it's more difficult for us to conduct our marijuana studies to treat PTSD than to do research with MDMA or for others to do psilocybin research. So a lot of our focus at a federal level um, policy-wise is on facilitating marijuana research and increasing the numbers of federally legal cannabis growers to do research with. Um, but I will say in the past five years it's been really exciting to see that shift and grow and as many of you I'm sure have been reading about um, with Denver and Oakland passing decriminalization initiatives and I know we have some folks here that are working to do that in the state of Oregon for psilocybin, which is very exciting. Um, and even at the federal level, um, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, and Congressman Matthew Gates, who's a, a Republican, did, introduced um, an amendment recently to increase access to psychedelic research. It did not pass, but it was really an exciting indication of the times to see and how far we're going and that people are really showing interest even at the federal level um, because of the great promise of, the, of our studies right now. Yeah, I'll add a, maybe a couple of things around the trends that have kind of framed um, the work that we've been doing. One being that we're in a paradigm now where we don't, as advocates and as activists working in this space, don't have to prove to anyone that there's a problem anymore in the sense that there's a general sense of awareness of the need for more effective mental health care in general. Uh, the crisis that we're seeing around despair deaths, around deaths by suicide or alcoholism or overdose or any variety of things um, has really at this point by 2019 affected almost everybody, like really almost Everyone that I know, and even when we go up to DC and speak to Congress people or staffers, like we don't have to say, you know, there's a mental health crisis in this country. People really get it. So we no longer have to really frame the problem, and so much of what we get to do now is offer solutions or offer some sort of direction for people to put their energy. 
Uh, and I might add that um, on top of recognizing the mental health crisis, I think people are really looking for new alternatives with dealing with the opiate crisis, um, which does open some opportunity to introduce medicines like ibogaine um, into the equation in a way that kind of weren't present before. Um, so that has been really an interesting move. And I guess just also reminds me that that has also helped um, mo help us move forward on issues around um, drug testing or substance analysis, um, which is really important for psychedelic substances. You know, MDMA is almost always adulterated with other substances when it's sold um, on the black market. So it's really key to be testing these things, but um, in the context of the opiate crisis, uh, because of the fentanyl crisis, uh, places have started to be open and pass legislation to decriminalize drug checking in that context, which then extends to our work as well. Totally. And the other piece, I think, is that we're, as we get closer and closer to medicalization, you know, as, or as I'm sure you've heard if you've been in here, MDMA is about two years from FDA approval, if all things go as according to plan. Um, everyone knows how plans work. Um, but we're getting closer and closer to the reality and awareness that as we work toward medicalization, we're also operating within, especially in the United States, in a pay for healthcare model, which essentially means that in order to afford healthcare in the United States, you have to actually have the funds to either have insurance or be covered in some other way. So as we get closer to this really amazing breakthrough of potentially having legal access to psychedelic medicine, um, under you know this medical paradigm, which has a lot of pluses, quality control, quality of care, um, accountability, um, and really specialized care for people who are highly traumatized or who have extreme need. The flip side to that is that in order to, right now in the United States, the way it's structured, in order to, to maintain that structure of care, um, there's a tremendous cost. So part of what we have been thinking about a lot in the last few years is what exactly does it mean to be creating medical access in a paradigm where the only way you get medical access is if you can afford it. And I think that's one of the core things that we have been thinking about that we want to talk about today. And it, a lot of that comes down to if we really believe that the benefits of psychedelics ought to be available to all people that can benefit from them, which isn't always everybody. It isn't necessarily for everybody, but for people who can benefit from them based on their personal history, their trauma history, where they're at, their support systems, et cetera, then we have a moral imperative to actually solve these problems around financial access and cost. I guess along those lines, something that I know we, we t speak about a lot um, is looking to indigenous cultures who've used plant medicines for millennia and use them in community in context of drinking in circles. Um, and you know, right now we're looking at models with two therapists and one person, which we're finding to be incredibly effective also. But when we're starting to kind of vision other ways forward that would increase access, uh, something that's really important um, I believe is to really think about this circle model um, because beyond even the treatment component, the circle brings in a community that helps integrate and support people, which is such an important part of your healing process. Um, and yeah. Some of you might have heard Mitchell Gomez speak, um, the executive director of DanceSafe. And one of the things that Mitchell says that I really appreciate is as you know, Michael Pollan writes his book, and as people become more interested in psychedelics, and it becomes less and less stigmatized to talk about psychedelics, um, a lot of people are becoming interested in seeking their own experiences. And then they come to this barrier, not just the cost barrier, but also you know, the barrier of access. Like, how do you find someone who you can work with, whether it's in the underground or not? How do you find someone who you trust? How do you know that those systems exist? So simultaneously, as we get more and more interest, you have more and more people seeking access. And going to what Natalie was saying earlier, this is why these underground methods of quality control, whether they're substance analysis tests or these other trust networks, become so important. Because it's not just about, you know, what, until we have these frameworks in place where people know that they can get quality care in a way that's actually legitimate, that's actually, that has oversight. We have a lot of people who are seeking experiences and in underground that may or may not be ready to hold that. So a big part of these of substance analysis, of things like the Zendo, of harm reduction, like the Queer Dome. Queer Dome, shout out to Ariel for that amazing talk right before. Um, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's give, her, let's give them a round of applause. Having the Queer Dome here is a huge deal. It's a huge deal. 
um, especially in a place where people are engaging in, as in Ariel's words, so much gender fuckery and so much um, exploration in that way. So it's just really critical to be thinking about these two pieces, like what's going on at the superstructure level, the, the meta level, the structure, the medicine, and then what's happening in the underground all the time simultaneously and how can we support both at the same time. I guess also along those lines, I think it's important, one, to think about as long as these things are underground, um, that they are much safer pe for people who are not marginalized, right? And so again, that even really affects access. Um, so I think it is really exciting to also hold that things like ketamine therapy are now legal um, and accessible in more, more part. Um, So we have a lot to say about a lot of different topics, but we actually wanted to get an idea of what y'all wanted to hear. So just to give you a general overview, I mean, we're really, we've been thinking a lot about ketamine therapy. We would like, you know, we've been thinking about Johnson & Johnson making Supervato a medicine and how, what that means with respect to generic ketamine access. We've been thinking a lot about um, the actual cost and insurance framework of MDMA therapy and how that would work. Um, we've been thinking a lot about the actual uh, training of practitioners. There was a question right at the end of Ariel's talk about how do, how do you train? Like, what's the difference between training and like the normal Zendo and the queer dome? What's that specialized aspect? And that's a really big question because one of the um, things that has come up is that if the perp if the people who are experiencing the care, whether it's in a therapeutic context or you know in a harm reduction context, ultimately the if we know and we believe that the therapeutic relationship between the practitioner and the person who's receiving the care is such a critical part of the healing, then it really, really matters who's actually offering the healing and what work they've done on themselves and training they have. So another big kind of angle that we've been thinking about is what exactly do we do to make sure that people are properly trained and actually prepared to handle a diversity of clients, whether they're black people, whether they're trans people, whether they are refugees, whether they're people from outside of the culture of the practitioners themselves, and how exactly to onboard people in a way that prepares them to do that care without causing more harm, whether it's through microaggressions or something much more significant within the therapy context. I am really curious. I come from a background in agriculture, and so I'm wondering if there's any conversations going on. Um, what I've seen in cannabis is a product that is being sold as medicine that couldn't be farther from, based on the lack of regulation around a lot of the pesticides and things that are allowed to be used that we don't even have research on. Um, so are those conversations going on, and how can we, how can we um, effectively ensure that growing practices of plant medicines, obviously with chemicals, uh, substances that are not plant medicines, it's a different ball game because it's straight chemistry, but how can we protect the sanctity of what should be medicine? So the question was about um, how to protect the sanctity of the, of the medicines, especially the plants, given the, um, what we're seeing with cannabis. Um, and I'm, I might even add hemp to that, which is kind of being fit directly into an industrial agriculture model, um, which on one hand is great because it might you know, reduce our reliance on timber, but on the other hand means we're putting these powerful substances into a massive kind of hyper-structured agro-economy, agro-agro-economy, agro you might say. <laughs> Um, and how to do that. It's a really, really good question. I can answer a bit about, um, on one hand, uh, how, how people are thinking about it with respect to ayahuasca and iboga and peyote. I can briefly speak about that. And then I think Natalie might, say, might share a little bit about um, MDMA and what we've been learning about sassafras, actually. So um, there's a couple levels to it. Um, it is absolutely the case that the increase of interest in plant medicines is resulting in more harvesting. And in some cases, that means unsustainable harvesting. So some people may know already that, for example, um, plants like peyote are endangered in parts of the United States. Um, the way that the peyote is ac accessed through like, the formal structure that the DEA has created with the Native American church is limited and unfortunately has led to some exploitation of the plant. This is also true in Mexico to some extent, although for different reasons. Um, and similarly with ayahuasca, because there's been such a huge boom in the globalization of ayahuasca, especially in the last 15 years, um, 
because these aren't plants that grow overnight, peyote takes de literally decades to mature, ayahuasca at least seven to 10 years, um, where there's a legitimate concern about where exactly the sourcing coming from, comes, comes from. And I'll add that like as an additional piece to that, as the sourcing becomes more challenging, the cost goes up. And one of the phenomenons that's been happening is that some of these plant medicines are becoming too expensive for the original peoples that have been using them to actually afford them. And that's like a pretty big travesty and one of the major side effects of globalization. So on one hand, um, I do know that there's a good number of, the, of ayahuasca practitioners and ayahuasca centers that are in South America, especially that are beginning to harvest, that are beginning to actually plant and harvest and create kind of their own sustainable grows. Um, and I think that there's this uh, idea that that's like kind of um, sacrilegious because it's all supposed to be wild harvested, but it is absolutely the case that indigenous practitioners um, in the Amazon have been harvesting and growing ayahuasca for quite some time. It is definitely happening at a scale that ha hasn't happened before. Um, but ultimately, I think that what we're going toward is trying to find that like balance between permaculture and access to the medicine. Um, my understanding from what I do know about what's happening in the Amazon is that it's in route, not ideal yet, but more and more um, centers are actually paying attention to this. I was just at the World Ayahuasca Conference in Girona with some people that are in here, actually. Um, and I went to every single um, uh, um, retreat center, and I asked them, I was like, what's your social impact policy? Like, what's, what's going on there? And my impression is that we're just at the cusp where there's a critical mass of retreat centers that are aware that this is an issue that they really want to tackle. And just to be frank, it's, it's something that can be used for marketing. Like, people want to know that their medicine is grown sustainably and ecologically safe. So I do think that there is an interest. I think what hasn't existed yet is a kind of an oversight structure or like um, a system that actually creates accountability. Um, and that's harder here in the US in places where it's actively prohibited, where there's active criminalization, partially because one of the side effects of having everything go underground means that you don't really have oversight or regulation. Regulation is kind of a dirty word, and there's aspects about it that can be really scary, but one of the benefits of having some sort of legal framework, or at least decriminalized framework with some oversight, is that you have some sort of, um, uh, that you can have some accountability there. Um, I do think that ultimately it's going to be for a while until there is that structure, it's going to be on the people. So like people like yourselves that might be interested in going down to Peru or to Colombia or Brazil to actually ask questions about where the medicine is coming from and how it's being harvested. And I would add um, how the people that are working with the medicine are being treated and being paid. Um, because one of the major models for the retreat centers that has been happening is uh, paying local people extremely low wages because they're aligned with what they're getting paid there. Um, knowing full well that you know the Americans or Canadians, Europeans that are coming in are getting charged seven thousand dollars for ten days or more. So I do think that it has it's both um, putting pressure on the actual people who are holding and offering these plant medicines, um, whether they're individual practitioners or retreat centers, to ask to ask questions about where it's coming from, and also to some extent on the retreat centers themselves to actually start paying attention to that and being part of it. Um, I'll add one last thing with iboga in particular um, with ibogaine. So there was a really big concern around um, the sourcing of ibogaine, which for many years was primarily sourced through iboga, which is a shrub that um, exists primarily in Gabon and Cameroon in West, central West Africa. The really good news is that in the last few years, because of the concern around ibogaine, there's been um, a lot of research toward what other plants contain ibogaine besides iboga. And I just saw a presentation about a year and a half ago from my friend Jonathan Dickinson of um, a list of like 20 plants um, that exist all over the world, including in Mexico and South America and other places that contain ibogaine. So I'm really encouraged by the possibility of finding sources for some of these substances in other places. That still comes up to the kind of sticky question of to what extent is it appropriate to you know, extract a chemical from a plant that's like its own kind of existential ethical question. But ultimately, when it comes to the sourcing itself, I do feel like that there's enough momentum and hopefully care from people like yourselves who are actually interested in eating psychedelics and having these experiences to actually push back on that. Yes, you were asking just for me to speak a bit about um, sassafras and speaking you know, of even medicines like MDMA that you know we at MAPS now derive from petroleum, um, but MDMA is, can be derived from saffron oil, which comes from sassafras, which is a plant medicine that's used across the U.S. Um, by Native folks. And we recently were learning a bit more about that at this training that Ismail mentioned for communities of color, um, which was a really powerful grounding way 
um, to bring that into the space, even when you know the medicine technically is now from petroleum, but to remember that we're still learning from cultures that have been using these medicines in different ways for so long. Um, so I think that is kind of a way that we do continue to try to hold the plants and medicines with respect and learn from them, even when we're not directly using plant medicines. And also just lastly, with respect to ayahuasca, um, some people may have heard that ayahuasca is starting to get cultivated in places like Hawaii and Florida. Um, my understanding is that generally, as long as the way that the growing is done is an in integrity and the creation of the medicine itself is an in integrity, um, that's generally considered acceptable. And there's an awareness that um, we really can't all be going down to the Amazon. Um, and actually, while we're on it, I want to just bring in the Amazon and maybe take a moment to, for us to send some of this amazing burner love, energy, joy in that direction. Um, the Amazon is on fire. We are here in the dust in a place that used to be filled with water. And I just want to honor the water that was here, the living beings that were here, those of us that are here now. And really, to the extent that you're able to, when you go back home, to really do some research and see what you can do from wherever you live to support the struggle that's happening there. The struggle is not just about the clear cutting of forests for agribusiness like meat and soy. It is also the active continued genocide of the indigenous people who have cared for the Amazon for millennia. So I just want to acknowledge that these questions, when we're, and I really appreciate that question, when we're talking about plants, we're also talking about people and practices. And that ultimately, the core element of the struggle is not just protecting the plants, it's also about protecting the land and the people who've cared for it. On that subject, is there a proper way of going about obtaining uh, ayahuasca in the states that you would recommend in a sustainable sense versus traveling down south? Because I know that that is a question on a lot of people's minds, and it's a scary question because in society when we ask it, we're normally shut down or viewed differently. So in a safe area, what's your answer to that? This is a really challenging question. And it goes back to the original kind of point. Um, I just want to give a shout out. There's a few people in here who've been working toward advocacy for decriminalization and legalization of substances, drugs, Schedule One, and other drugs for a really long time. I just really want to honor that work because ultimately the reason I can't get, I, I will give an answer to that question, but the reason I can't give a good one is because we're still operating under prohibition. And until we live in, or as long as we live in a paradigm where um, drug use and cultivation and experiences remain criminalized, which also includes stigmatization, et cetera, and particularly landing on marginalized people, um, the, we have to rely on underground networks. I will say that, um, kind of going to what you were saying earlier on substance analysis also, there's this uh, really, there's this awesome trend you might have heard of called the dark web. Um, for a long time, it was really exciting because having quality control, even if only through like user experiences, um, actually created a lot, was, was a whole element of harm reduction for drug sales. Because when you know what you're getting or, or when you're able to kind of crowdsource the quality aspect, you know, think Yelp for drugs, where you're like, okay, how many stars is the seller? Where is it coming from? How can you hold people accountable in that way? Um, then at least you have some sort of uh, community-based accountability. Um, as law enforcement gets more aware of how the dark web works and how those sources work, it's getting harder and harder and less and less safe to utilize the dark web. At this point, I wouldn't really recommend people to use it to, get, to access substances because it's very risky and customs has gotten really wise to how, how, how the flows go. Um, so to really answer your question, that actually unfortunately has to do with these underground trust networks and finding communities that are working with ayahuasca, whether it's in religious contexts like the Santo Daime or the Unidad de Vegetal, or the many um, increasingly organized underground communities that are sourcing their medicine either from people that they know in Brazil or Peru or from places like Hawaii. A lot of the medicine, the ayahuasca in particular, that's coming onto the West Coast is coming from farms in Hawaii that people like Terrence McKenna and others started um, 30 years ago or so. And um, generally speaking, I've heard that as a, as a good option, but um, unfortunately there isn't like a website that you can go to just yet to find where the good ayahuasca in the U.S. is. 
Um, I guess your question also made me kind of reflect on what's happening in Oakland, where, as Izzy said, though there's decriminalized decriminalization of plant medicine, still we're operating you know, in a federal system of prohibition. Um, and some folks who are working on peyote preservation actually reached out to us really concerned after Oakland decriminalization because though you know it's decriminalized in one context, it's not elsewhere, and just understanding how that might impact all of these other systems. Um, and that peyote itself um, is a scarce resource in the United States. and so people were really concerned that there would be an influx of use. So I do really invite ev everyone to be really intentional and conscious of the medicines that they're using and their sources um, and, and their purity. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, oh, more close. Hi. So um, I really appreciate the um, policy approaches that have been taken to increase access to um, psychedelic medicine. And I'm wondering if you all could talk about the role of the psychedelic renaissance in the larger decarceration movement and how, um, especially through partnership, you all are working to remove the whole umbrella of prohibition. Um, and then secondly, since a lot of the approach seems to be through the medical industrial complex, what the what the uh, what the benefits and drawbacks of legalization versus decriminalization are great question um, so that is definitely something Ismail and I work a lot on is connecting kind of psychedelic activism in the community to this broader movement for drug decriminalization and decarceration um, and, you know, we were mentioning different ways earlier where we find really amazing opportunities for collaboration. And we are finding that there is actually a lot of um, resistance and pushback in the psychedelic community. Um, and that there's a lot of feelings of psychedelic exceptionalism. Um, psychedelics are super magical medicines, but there are many other ma magical medicines too that, um, you know, as Rick has often said, the more dangerous a substance has the ability to be, the more necessary it is to make it legal so we can make it regulated and make it safe. Um, so that's definitely a really important part of our work. And we're hoping to you know, engage with people that are really enthusiastic about you know, psilocybin decriminalization to, to question how they can work with their, the other communities that are working for broader drug decriminalization. Um, something I think is really exciting about the psychedelic piece of it is that often uh, movements for drug decriminalization are quite focused on the harms because that's kind of where we have to be with public health and this is to make increased safety. Um, and with the psychedelic space, I think there's a lot of opportunity to talk about all of the kind of benefit maximization of decrim and not just decreasing harms. So I believe that's like a really important conversation for us to be seeding in a fuller way. And I think psychedelics have a, a big role to play in that conversation. Um, and you mentioned, you know, incarceration. We are also kind of working to understand better the numbers of arrests that are tied to psychedelics because often data actually isn't kept that separates different medicines. Um, we know in Denver, I think there were 11 arrests before um, the year before decriminalization. So um, we would guess that compared to other substances, there probably aren't quite as many, though I would also venture to guess that medicines like MDMA that are one of the most used you know, illicit substances, there are much higher rates of incarceration. Um, and that is definitely something we're gonna continue um, speaking about the need for decriminalization in these con medical contexts when, you know, if people have access through medical routes that um, might be more expensive or what have you to the, the people that are, um, to, to ensure that people are not still going to prison for these same medicines that other people can just pay for. Um, on the thing, question about medical access, there's a concern that I've heard quite a bit about this, uh, this belief that as psychedelics become more accessible in medical contexts, that'll increase the kind of the harms of prohibition in the sense that, well, there will be some psychedelics that are okay because they're medically acceptable, but the prohibition framework will continue and people who use them outside of that context will re remain criminalized. 
Um, and that's why I think part of what we've been working on is kind of this two-pronged approach. Um, where, of course, we're working to establish the benefits through science and research, um, but we also do work, for example, by um, submitting information to the U.S. Sentencing Commission as we have more and more information about psychedelics um, and their benefits and their um, actual harms, like, you know, their actual risks as opposed to the risks that Oprah was talking about in 2001. Um, we can utilize that information to actually work for, work towards shifting the um, the impact on incarceration itself. On the more meta question you have, um, I would actually say that there's a step in my mind between decarceration and um, abolition of prisons in general and legalization of drugs or access to drugs in, in more regulated contexts, and that's around mental health care. So as a lot of you probably know, um, mental health care, especially crisis intervention care in this, in this country and most places around the world is pretty abysmal. Um, and one of the interesting trends that I've been seeing, um, both in the conversation around what's happening in Oregon as well as what we're seeing in Oakland and Denver, is this concern about, well, what happens when people take psychedelics and then go crazy or have a really bad experience and either harm themselves or harm someone else or cause some sort of damage? Um, and I think that, you know, even though the numbers for, for incarceration on psychedelics besides MDMA are relatively low, and LSD is actually also something that a lot of people are arrested for, um, what isn't captured as much or as well, um, even worse, I would say, than that information is captured, which is pretty poor, um, is the extent to which uh, crisis support or crisis experiences, spiritual emergence experience, experiences happen that are or are not related to psychedelics. So I'm, what we're starting to see is this window where Okay, psychedelics are getting more mainstream acceptance. More and more places, local and state governments are becoming, and, and legislators are becoming more interested in bringing forward policies to shift that. We're hearing from legislators in all these states that want to be like the first person in their state to bring forward a bill around psychedelics. You know, there's a lot of the momentum. Um, and the number one question I've been hearing from law enforcement and from city councils is, well, what happens when people go crazy or something really bad happens? And the, the answer that I would love to give is, oh, then we use your super well-structured uh, mental health crisis support that you already have infrastructure to, to, on, you know, to, to just to, to handle some of these psychological crises. Unfortunately, none of that infrastructure actually exists. So in, in, in our mind, one of the kind of openings that's available here is if we are able to see funding and we, if we are able to see support from local law enforcement around um, actually creating some sort of structure for people who are having challenging experiences in public or in places that, th that could be, that could result in harm to themselves or others, that we put that within, put that sliver kind of within a larger mental health crisis response paradigm. And my, my dream is that we have lots and lots of funding from local governments who are super stoked about psychedelics and that we put that toward mental health care support, crisis support, with psychedelic training being a piece of that. Because plenty of people who are having spiritual emergence or um, breaks or kind of challenging, really challenging um, mental experiences are not taking psychedelics and they also need care. And I feel like our priorities are kind of out of whack if we're going to be helping the people who are taking mushrooms and like driving the wrong way down the street, but not the people who are literally suffering every single day on the streets of a lot of our cities and spending a lot of time without any support, much less the psychedelics that they need to actually heal that. So that's definitely the direction I kind of see it as like a window. Hopefully we can use psychedelics, ironically, I guess, as a Trojan horse for actual mental health care. Hi. Um, I want... I want to know more about how do you choose, how do you select the people that you know that they can provide these services? In Mexico, we have, there is an organization that they, in order to be a facilitator of, of TOTH, you have to be vouched by other three people that are also vouched by other three people. And yeah, but so it's like, Everyone is taking care of everyone at the same at the same time. So that's how they do in this organization. But I want to know more about. Yeah, the question was about how how do we choose practitioners and um, this person was mentioning that in one of the ways that uh, facilitators in Mexico who work with Toad choose is that they have three people vouch for them before they can get trained. Is that right? Is that about right? And like that there's like a kind of a community accountability that gets based by having people vouch for each other. So do you want to talk a little about how we choose therapists and how we do that? Yeah. So 
Right now our focus is PTSD work, so one of the most important qualifications for therapists is that they have deep experience working with trauma and understanding trauma. Um, also, we look for therapists that have um, experience with more holistic approaches to trauma. Um, people trained in somatic therapy, Hakomi is a type of, of body-centered work that aligns really well with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Um, but really, we, um, people, you know, we take people from all different disciplines, which I think is a really beautiful part of this work. Often, mental health care is kind of siloed. I'm trained as a social worker, you know, and like a psychiatrist would work in a kind of a different context often. But in our setting, we have two different therapists, and they're almost always from different backgrounds um, professionally. So even that gives kind of a more holistic uh, approach as well trying to think of other qualifications. I know one thing I'll, I'll mention from Hakomi that I find really to be important um, is this principle of loving presence. Um, and in, in a therapy session, I do think being able to kind of provide that support and that loving presence is really one of the most important pieces. And we do know that with MDMA or without MDMA, um, the therapeutic alliance or the relationship between the, the patient and the therapist is you know, the most healing, the most the best indication of what's going to really be helpful. Um, so, definitely looking for people that are that are able to develop that kind of um, loving presence and relationship with people they're working with. Um, I guess I'll also mention that, as Izzy said, we are really looking for therapists that come from a range of different backgrounds as well. Um, thus far, many of our therapists trained most have been white folks, and we're really hoping to train people from all different backgrounds, different religions, different sexual orientations to make sure that we have therapists that are really prepared to provide safe, loving spaces for all different kinds of folks as well. Um, because I think, as he was mentioning this a bit, but we are finding as we're, we're going that also, like other types of therapy, though, you know, therapists can um, work with people in different contexts, that especially in a space like MDMA that creates a, a very vulnerable, trusting container um, that it seems that it really helps to, to have, you know, someone that you really trust and feel safe with. One more really quick thing, sorry. It's a really good question with a lot of aspects to it. Um, a part of my role as policy counsel, which is basically around legal strategy, also has to do with like infrastructure and including ethics. So one of the other big pieces, I think, to answer your question is that we've been in the process of developing like our ethical oversight framework. We've done a draft. We have a code of ethics that's available. We're definitely going to be continuing to revise it and expand on it. And I think to kind of more directly answer your question, as this field gets bigger and bigger, the question is really around what is the oversight look like and like how do we ensure that practitioners are safe? Um, and I think for, from a legal regulated perspective, that's going to come down to um, the extent to which we have independent bodies that are working with practitioners, that are working with organizations like MAPS to ensure that the practitioners are getting the kind of oversight that they need. So if you're interested, I urge you to check it out. There's a code of the MAPS ther MDMA therapist code of ethics. The first draft is online at our MDMA um, training for therapists of color. We had some amazing feedback. We're going to continue to revise it and kind of grow on it. Um, and really try to develop a framework that we, we, we believe we can trust. So if people are going to be working in this modality, that they follow the, you know, this basic framework to ensure that they're as safe and, and effective as possible. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, first of all, huge gratitude for the work that you're doing. So this is awesome. And. Um, you talked. You both mentioned the training that you just did, um, the MDMA training with the people of color. What um, issues did you learn about that you think will become really important in um, a world where there's medicalized access or even post-prohibition access? And maybe what are some of the things that we as a community can start thinking about even now? Because knowing that time frame is still uh, developing. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, hmm, there are definitely a lot of a lot of exciting things, um, you know. And one thing that did really come up was really uh, continuing to examine our protocol and and the way that we are delivering this medicine and and talking about the medicine, the language we're using. Um, 
got a lot of different feedback on ways to kind of expand and change that. Um, I think we also got a lot of interesting feedback about different kind of models and ideas around um, access um, and different ways to use uh, different therapy modalities to integrate in that maybe we hadn't yet or to use integration. Um, yeah, something that came to me when you asked just left me, so I'll pass it. Um, a couple of things. One is um, this question of community-based care and how community-based care is offered and given. Um, and this is kind of like the beautiful tie between like the Zendo harm reduction model and the medicalized access, like oversight quality control framework, which is like, well, what's that, that, those are two relatively different frameworks, as at least for now. And like, what's what's the thing in the middle? What's the bridge? Um, it was really good to have a, a pretty good contingent of harm reduction therapists that were at the training, and we learned a lot about the harm reduction therapy model, which is a little bit different from traditional psychotherapy in the sense that they're working with people who are actively using drugs. They know that they're using drugs. They know that that's part of the paradigm. Um, and thinking about, well, if you can extend that model into different kinds of care for people who are at different stages. Um, so I think that, for example, um, we know that a lot of communities, whether they're communities of color from different kind of um, parts of the United States or parts around the world, um, have not or ha have cosmologies that don't always fit with like a highly individualized healing model. Um, Western psychotherapy tends to focus on the healing of the individual, with, you know, in relation to the two therapists that, or to the therapist that they're working most directly with. And that's a little bit of a challenge for people like myself and many others who I can see in this room who maybe come from more collectivist models of healing. So when we're thinking about healing things like intergenerational trauma, we're thinking about community trauma or these lo like long-term um, side effects uh, or post effects of enslavement or genocide. We're not really just talking about individual healing. We're talking about healing within the context of the collective. So to more directly answer that question, I would love to see more um, acknowledgement of and organizing around community-based healing models that may or may not even have to do with psychedelics. Ultimately, psychedelics are a tool that can be utilized in different models. And I think to, to start with those community frameworks and then letting psychedelics be one of many tools that then are available to people, which can only happen once people are properly trained. Um, and I just, to that end, I want to give a shout out to the, I'm not going to point them out because I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but there's a couple of people in this room who were at our workshop in Kentucky and at the training, and I just really want to send love to you all for being here, and I'm just so grateful that you were out there, and um, if you want to say something, I'd, I'd welcome it, but I'm just really grateful that, that y'all were in Kentucky on the 16th floor with us of a haunted hotel, and also here at Burning Man two weeks later. Shout out. I also wanted to, to speak to what Izzy was starting to speak about with um, the context of intergenerational systemic trauma that is experienced every day um, and what it looks like to treat that trauma when you're kind of constantly revisiting and, and going back to that space. You know, unlike when we work with veterans who might be healing trauma they experience from war or from their childhood, often the combination of two um, that are many times can be things that are in the past. So uh, that's something that many therapists were asking and, and engaging with what that looks like, what in, how integration might look different. May, maybe that requires more community models um, to hold space for the continued process of healing, even in these systems that are continuing to, to traumatize people every single day. Um, you know, I've spoken to some researchers that are excited about maybe doing a study using you know, MDMA a group work to work with um, trans folks experiencing trauma. Um, and for, you know, that's a population that, does, that ever, an experience every day can really um, um, be re-triggering even in the healing process. And something that we really um, are engaging with is often after that healing space, you can be in quite a vulnerable, gentle, soft space um, and how to kind of hold that hold that container for healing um, in this world that we're living in.
There's an article, I can't remember what it's called, but I think it has to do with like, there's no post in PTSD. It's written by a Palestinian um, therapist who talks about the phenomenon of people who experience PTSD with no post, where it's just traumatic, traumatic stress disorder that's just constantly happening because as a result of their identity. Um, so there is an interesting ethical question of like, what you know, what's the difference between treating acute single issue trauma, which is absolutely real, um, and how, how, how treating that is different than treating traumatic stress, traumatic stress that's like constantly occurring or that's identity based where like we're trying to heal based on, you know, some paradigm of what's happened in someone's life, knowing that they're going back out into a world that will continue to cause that trauma and what the ethics are around that and really how to, how to manage that and how to be aware that not everyone who's experiencing trauma is better after their sessions is, is suddenly, you know, escaping that what, what, what caused them that in the first place. So we have time for one more question, and this gentleman had his hand up, so I just want to honor that. And for anybody that would like to speak with either Izzy or Natalie afterwards can um, exit out the side here, and they'll be able to visit with you a little bit as we transition the program. Hi, thanks for your talk. My question is about uh, post-medicalization economics of MDMA psychotherapy, and what the vision is right now, like currently at $10,000 per person to have a therapist training for expanded access. It's very limited for who can do the training. I'm wondering if that's the future vision that MAPS has to continue a similar training program and whether MAPS has a vision of continuing to be the arbitrator of who can and cannot provide MDMA psychotherapy like any other substance out there. There's no certain um, arbitrator of who can prescribe and who can't. How does MDMA vision having quality control of therapists after medical medicalization occurs? It's a great question, and I'm happy. I think Rick is speaking next to, us to speak a bit more on that topic. Um, I think I'll say a word just about MAPS's um, economic structure, which I'm really proud of. Um, so MAPS, Izzy and I work at the nonprofit, but the MAPS nonprofit birthed a public benefit corporation that actually conducts all of our research and the sole funder in the benefit corporation is the nonprofit. So that's one way that right now it allows us to prioritize social benefit over prox profit maximization, um, which is something we find really important when we're looking at medicines that you know, can heal in like three sessions. But I hear your, your question about you know, $10,000 sessions. Um, and right now, one of our main priorities is making sure that this medicine is covered by insurance um, so that it is accessible even in the, those contexts um, because even though $10,000 is an insane amount, if you actually add up costs of PTSD treatment over 10, 20 years, it's much smaller than that. So we're really hopeful that there's a really good um, path forward with that. But again, that's you know why we are having conversations about group models and um, other contexts. Um, we definitely envision clinics where there are a host of different medicines. You know, maybe there are many ketamine therapy clinics um, emerging now, and I know that many of them hope to include MDMA therapy after um, approval, maybe psilocybin therapy. Um, so I think that there will be kind of interesting models that develop around that. Um, I'll also add that just from a, like, so the medicine itself, like the cost of the medicine is quite low. Um, and a lot of that, that number has to do with the number of therapy hours required, which isn't a cost that we're setting, that's a cost that's being set by therapists because therapists have you know, costs for their time. So going to what Natalie was saying, I think thinking about group models, thinking of ways to reduce the amount of basically cost per hour per person is probably the way that it's gonna make the most sense to do that. Um, and um, when you're talking to payers like the VA, the Veterans Administration or others, paying ten or fifteen thousand dollars for a session is really, really, really cheap compared to the two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars they're spending per person over the course of their lifetime in care. So a lot of it has to do with convincing the people who would be actually paying for the treatment as opposed to the individuals because ultimately it most ultimately the goal is to not have that cost be on the individual. Ultimately the real goal is to have universal health care and have it covered by a real insurance policy that actually covers everyone. But unless we unless we vote in the right people in the next round, um, you know, that's we, we're working with a system that we have now and also believe in looking at those larger structural things that can actually reduce the cost in a meaningful way, because that's a very, very legit question. And actually one more last thing to, to your kind of the implication that you were starting with. Um, right now because the psychedelic kind of therapy um, field is so small, although it's rapidly increasing, thanks to some of you amazing people in the room. 
Um, we, uh, I, I personally believe that in an ideal world, we have multiple independent bodies that are doing certification and oversight. Like, I don't think in an ideal world you'd have one organization that's doing training and oversight and accountability and da da da. da. Like in most other fields, you have multiple organizations, you have professional organizations, all these other pieces. Um, that doesn't exist yet. So right now, we're kind of doing what we can with the code of ethics, et cetera, to fill these gaps. But ultimately, as the field increases, ideally, we see more and more actors that can work in coalition to do that kind of work, as opposed to having it all centralized. Like, believe me, we don't want to be doing every single piece of everything. We can't wait for there to be more people who are able to hold some of that. And the reality is because there hasn't been as much funding or interest up until quite recently, um, we've had to do what we can to fill the gaps while they, while they exist and as they come up. All right. So we're coming to the end of this uh, session. Uh, if I just can add two, two little mini infos to, uh, to things you touched upon. One is that in terms of Iboga, you said that um, you know, there's now a lot of new sources, new plants that can be explored. Uh, we, with our foundation, ICERS, we just did an engagement pr project with the whole community. Uh, and it's clear that most of the Ibogaine that's used comes from Tabernante Iboga, uh, which is a plant which seems to be endangered. In Gabon, there's big problems. We're now currently doing a field study there with local uh, looking at what's the reality on, on ground. Um, but if you're going to do ibogaine, you know, you have to be very aware of that. The only really sustainable source right now comes from Vakanga Africana, which they can transfer in, into ibogaine. Uh, but unless there's not solutions to that, iboga really is quite an unsustainable plan to, to use. No? So just be aware of that. And then lastly, in terms of the Amazon is, is burning. Um, just when you were speaking, uh, of magically, I was connected to uh, the, you know, the telephone connection. A WhatsApp came in from our colleagues and friends of Umiak in, in, um, in Colombia. So an indigenous uh, grassroots organization. Uh, that are there really, you know, using Yahe Ayahuasca to unite the communities against all the problems that they have there with oil extraction and so forth. And the bad news has come that this, the ex-first person of the FARC, of the guerrilla, just has decided to take our, the arms again. So it seems like another whole, uh, you know, war uh, is going to start in Colombia, right in the, where all the indigenous communities are. They have suffered so much for all this time. Uh, with all the violence, with the paramilitaries, the FARC, all of that, I've seen it you know, firsthand, how ba basically everybody is traumatized there. They have a lot of trauma out of this, and they, they just decide to take the guns up again and start the armed conflict. So that's really bad news. So I just also, in addition to looking of ways to supporting the Amazon, uh, you know, look up um, you know, what's happening in Colombia and how to support the indigenous organization. And UMIAC, uh, website is umiac.org, U M I yac.org is a very interesting organization to look at because they're using ayahuasca to really unite all of those communities in defense of, of their land and their, their community well-being. So thank you. Let's give a, thank give you, a big thank applause to Natalie and Ismael.